The chicks are getting so big. They're like two weeks old. <laughs> this week, today, actually. Um, to introduce you, this is Bay. Here in the corner, she's a light Brahma. This is Clove. She is a black Australorp. This is Ginger, the third. She's a Buff Orpington. This is Chia. She is a Bard Rock. And this is Saffron. She is a Speckled Sussex. So they should start laying in August, I believe. They're very, very good girls. For the most part. <laughs> we recently have been doing spring cleaning and I wanted to clean out our deep freeze and get some of the meat that had been sitting there over the winter canned up. Um, it's, I don't mind keeping a bunch of food in the freezer when it's cold outside, uh, just because if the power does go out, we can just move the freezer outside <laughs> and it stays nice and cold. But as it starts to get warmer and we start getting into storm weather, um, the deep freeze becomes increasingly uh, unreliable. Just, you know, we don't know if the power goes out, how long it'll be out sort of thing. And then it also opens up more space for the garden produce. So here we have, I canned up, I have not washed these jars yet after pulling them out of the pressure canner. We have venison and chicken. And what I'm, these, I'm going to be showing you guys how we go through and pressure can all of it. But we want to take our rings off because it's got all these food particles and like residue. Like all the jars actually feel a little oily from being in the pressure canner. So I'm just going to be taking all of the rings off and double, triple checking the seals. You don't, you want, not only is this not making a that little noise that it makes when there's not a pressure seal or a vacuum seal, but you can pick it up by just the lid. Like there's a really good suction going on there. And so I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna use hot soapy water um, to just wipe down all the jars so they're nice and clean. That also keeps bugs and pests from being interested in your jars as much while they're stored in the cabinet. Yep, just making sure any that didn't set up well, since it's been sitting on the counter overnight, I'd usually just give to the give to the dogs or the chickens or something. Um, waste not, want not. But I'm gonna get all this cleared off, and then I'll meet you guys right back here for showing you how we get up to this stage. So I've got some water setting up to boil in this stock pot, and. Uh, I got some chicken breasts at the Walmart, and um, I paid a little bit more than I would have liked, about 40 cents more per pound than what I, we do at like Aldi's, but Aldi's is just completely wiped out right now, um, so paying a little bit more. And I glove up because I don't like getting chicken meat underneath my fingernails. But I do like to trim away all the hunks of fat. I like to check if it's, you know, no bones or anything like that um, in it. And since I'm canning in pint jars, I've got a sore spot right here from where I was doing this all day yesterday. Um, I'm going to go with maybe a little bit smaller of a chunk than I typically do, but compared to some of the other folks that I watch here on YouTube who do uh, like raw pack meat canning, um, I still do a pretty sizable chunk, but I don't mind that. It all shreds up in the end just fine. So just coming through. Ooh, one well, of my farts. Um, and I'm not super picky, like, oh, there's the trim, or particular. I just try to get it done. 
So I'm going to come through and I'm going to cut up this whole package. Just like so. So that's the last of our chicken. I'm going to get our surface cleaned up and start getting our jars ready. So here I have some freshly boiled water and I like to put my jars in. It seems like extra work but when they're so hot I don't like having to, when they're hot out of the water, I don't like having to touch them with my fingers too much if I can help it um, to like pick them apart. So I actually just like to go through and alternate. Now, since we're pressure canning, we don't have to worry about sterilizing so much, but this does get the rubber rings nice and soft. And what I mean by alternating them is you'll notice I've got some belly up and some belly down, and that just keeps them when I'm coming through with our little magnet stick, it'll pick up and they're really easy. To split apart so I don't know that's just something that I do I guess I don't know if it's actually effective but so I've got some very hot and soapy water here getting all of our rings and cans washed just want to make sure even though we are pressure canning and it's gonna be in there for like an hour and 15 minutes um, at like at least 10 pounds of pressure. I still never hurts to be just a little extra careful. So it's coming through and you can see it's 130 degrees. It drops pretty rapidly but it's pretty hot water um, is, the, is the moral of that story. Um, so I have to glove up or it scalds me. But it gets the jars nice and hot and ready. Now I'm trying to be kind of quick about this because I don't want to keep every keep the chicken out at room temperature. I don't have any preference to cur or ball jars. I just use what I have or what I can find on sale if I need to get more. And I'm setting up. I've got my freshly washed funnel and I am just packing in the chicken. I do try to only use wide mouth jars though. I really prefer having, like being able to fit my hand in there. And also, um, I wanted all of my jars to like be compatible, like all of my lids and rings and everything. And so I really like that. But uh, I also don't really make a whole lot of jams and jellies and stuff. So I don't really worry so much about needing smaller containers and even then you can find the smaller containers in wide mouth sometimes. Yeah. Trying my best to not make a huge mess but well <laughs> welcome to my kitchen <laughs> and I'm trying to get the chunks of chicken up to about an inch of headspace maybe a little less. Um, we are going to be topping this off with our boiled water but uh, I've turned the heat off because it got to a nice rolling boil. And this towel will most definitely need to go into the wash. Uh, I am making a mess. And I always try to prep up more jars than what I actually need. Um, that way I don't have like chicken hands and uh, just everything's kind of going and I, I run out of space but I still have food left. So 
I'd rather wash a few more jars than necessary, but be very well prepared. Get a meal somewhere. It looks like I'm gonna have enough for this jar and maybe a little bit of one more. So let's see, I'll probably be able to just pop off some of the other jars. Or just enough for this one, I don't know, we'll see. I've canned with ladies and gentlemen who uh, are very much more scientific about the way they go about this, though. So, and I admire that. <laughs> but I'm not one of those people. Okay, so I'm going to set our unused jars back off to the side. I'm going to de-glove. Get all that chicken goop. And now... I'm going to come through with just some regular salt. And I like to make my chicken just a little bit saltier because sometimes I'll use it for like a cold chicken salad or something and like uh, just eat it kind of out of the jar. So I use around a teaspoon and a half of salt per jar. And I use this funnel for everything when I'm canning because my aim is not that great. Coming around, okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, going back to our first jar. I'm now going to ladle our boiled water, still very, very hot, into the jars. So I like having the jars kind of preheated in the sink, um, so I'm not shocking the jars. And I'm putting in mostly to the one inch headspace. I don't want to overdo it. Because you can always add more, but it gets messy trying to pick some out. So, just ladling it in. And there's going to be all sorts of air bubbles trapped in there, in the jar. So what we're going to do next, I call it burp in my jars. Um, if you're new to canning and you buy the kit that has the can lifter and the little magnet thingy and the wide mouth, they'll often come with like this little bubble remover, like spatula thing. I just use a butter knife, but I just reach in through the side and burp it and I do that at four points and I just bring it in and then smush in and you can see that releases all these little gas bubbles or air bubbles and we want our water to be all around the chicken no bubbles so from our top view that looks like And this is another reason reason why I prefer the wide mouth jars. I, I don't much care for jars that have shoulders on them because uh, you can get air bubbles trapped up underneath there. It just, I don't know, it doesn't feel as just straightforward. And it's all right if it's, you know, kind of the boiling water you pour it in and it's kind of cooking with the chicken. That's where we're going to be cooking it in the canner anyways. So now I come through and I'm a little bit more careful about making sure that we have the correct amount of headspace in the jars. Just getting that too. You can hear the chicks playing in the other room. You could also season. Um, I like thyme and garlic and onion powder. In my chicken like this sometimes if I'm using it for in like a soup or a stew or who knows what but also you can always season it later so now we're gonna come through with some hot vinegar water the vinegar just removes the oils from the chicken or my fingers or anything like that and I just want to get any messy spills or anything 
up off of the edge of our jars. And now we'll come through and position our lids. You start to kind of build up resilience to the uh, heat with your fingers, but it's not pleasant. And we're just going to get them all positioned. Nice and centered. Like uh, some, some folks will reuse their lids. Um, but it depends on, you want a really nice seal. This rubber gasket here, that's the really important part of these lids. Because that's going to keep the air vacuumed. Now we have our clean rings. They are clean even if they look rusty and gross. And I'm just getting it down to like finger squeeze tight. And this is the noise I was talking about earlier. There's no vacuum seal there. So anybody's ever played with like a jelly jar at the breakfast table, uh, even like if it's just Smuckers or something, no vacuum seal. I love that noise as a kid. I'd sit there and do it till I get till I get yelled at. <laughs> yep. I just like making that noise even now. But you don't want it so cinched down tight that air is not going to be able to escape. Because as we're heating these in the canner, the hot air. The liquid's going to boil and it's going to be pushing air out and then as it cools it'll suction back down so we want that transition to be able to happen but we don't want stuff just blowing out the top so so this is my presto 23 quart canner and i have just a bit of water in the bottom uh, follow the manufacturer's instructions for your canner Oh, that's a big glug. Uh, normally I do a smaller glug than that um, of vinegar, but we have very hard water here, so um, that keeps the mineral deposits from happening on my jars. And these are some canned up venison. Did it the exact same way um, last night and then had them in the fridge, and then I just had them sitting out on the side counter while I was getting my chicken ready because I can fit 14... Uh, pint cans into this canner and I don't want them touching so they'll be rocking around hitting each other and I should have I've got a tray in the bottom that came with the canner and I have another one on the way but it's just not here yet and I'm not quite willing to wait I've been functioning for years without a tray for the second level anyhow <clears throat> but what I do is I'll just sit the cans on top of the one below them and I, I prefer I'd prefer a rack I think um, but make them do uh, so I didn't have quite enough cans to get a whole batch but oh wow so now I'm putting on our lid always check and make sure I checked the seal real well yesterday so I know it's doing doing well um, but just practice good safety. I always keep an extra seal in stock as well. They aren't too, too expensive. Firing up the gas. And I'm going to get this to, to where it's steaming uh, quite well. And I'll show you that when it's coming out through that hole there. And also you want to, again, I did this last night. So um, but you'll want to check and make sure that this valve hole is completely clear. So you can see it's steaming. And the back right here is starting to like kind of spit a bit. Whenever that goes, which might soon, oh, that would have been just too good for the timing. <laughs> but whenever it stands up, then I'm going to let this steam for 10 minutes. Oh, and timer starts. So we're up to pressure, or er, up to. 
been 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, and you can see we're blowing steam pretty regularly now. I'm gonna put that on there and we wanna build her up to 10 pounds of pressure. Um, I, I set a timer and come back every like three minutes or sit and do a project in the kitchen uh, just to be able to keep a really close eye on it. I honestly typically build it up to like 13 pounds of pressure uh, knock the heat down to low and then it just sits there uh, pretty well for the full hour and 15 um, but you know your stove and your pressure canner better than anybody just keep an eye on it because if it dips down below 10 I'm gonna have to start back over on my timer and that just eats up the day There you go, girls. <laughs> Don't pay attention to me. Pay attention to your chickweed. They love this stuff. Our time is up. It's been an hour and 15 minutes. We were riding kind of high on this one but everything held together just fine I'd rather be riding high than riding too low on the temperature so I'm just gonna turn the heat off and then come back in like half an hour so at this point we just want to let it cool down 100% at its own rate um, I've been tempted at times in the past to you know tap the little valve in the back or you know kind of bother it a bit no just leave it just just go do literally anything else um, just let it cool down uh, that's the safest way to go about it um, also a note on sterilizing the jars initially I do use very hot water out of the sink but I don't do like a full sterilization of the jars because we're doing it in the pressure canner I would sterilize them for at least 10 minutes if we were just doing a hot water bath so um, and again, this is kind of, this is just how I do it. I definitely recommend checking out either your county extension or your university extensions. Um, and uh, Ball has a whole bunch of different resources and cookbooks and recipe books and articles and different things that you can check out and really follow the instructions much better than I have here um, because you want to stay safe. Okay, our pressure's back down to zero. The little valve has gone back down. I'm going to remove our weight. And be sure to open the pot away from you because there's gonna be a lot of steam. So I'm actually gonna grab another oven mitt. the other side and so now I'm gonna use my can lifter to grab a can you can see it's still boiling there on the inside and I'm gonna set it over here onto our towel And I'm going to leave these cans to cool to room temperature for a few hours, um, no sense in rushing them. And then I'm going to remove the rings and wash them with hot soapy water. It looks like we had two cans on the second layer first. There, they broke along that bottom. Um, these are quite old cans that I'm using. I've gotten, oh, maybe three or four years of use out of them. 
yeah, so that was two cans. Um, so last batch I did, I didn't have any cans break, but I can't recommend eating the, uh, the chicken, like, or whatever it is that you can, just, just in case you don't want to eat glass, like, uh, so I'll probably compost it, um, but that what you do with that is on you. I don't know how to avoid this breakage over time. I don't know if that's just something that happens um, always or if maybe having the second rack uh, to separate the you know bottom and top layer might be helpful. So we'll kind of see how that goes. I'll keep you all in the loop. But I'd love to hear about y'all's experience with canning or pressure canning and if you have any breakage like that. And if you do, what do you do with it? Like, you know, I'm just shooting in the dark here on this. But So I hate to waste food, but again, I don't know if anybody ever feels like eating broken glass. <laughs> so... so once the cans are clean, dried, cooled, everything, I go through and mark what it is and what month I canned it. I don't get as specific as what day, just the month and the year. And I do that on all of the cans until they're all labeled. And then I load them up onto their long-term storage shelf. I try to avoid stacking the cans on top of each other because I want to be able to go through with just a quick feel and make sure that the lids are still secured. Um, if they're sitting on top of each other, the pressure of one can on top can keep that Kind of pressure you know held down I want it to actually be pretty easy for if they're filling up if there's you know bacteria activity happening I want it to be able to pop the lid off very easily because that's going to make it much more obvious to me before I eat it my personal goal is to keep six months worth of food in a constant rotation so I'm eating the oldest and you know setting the newest in the back I really like using these cans for casseroles and stews and soups and different things like that where I'd kind of be cooking the heck out of it anyways. Um, I love to eat canning on if I have an older chicken that needs cold or harvested um, or older rabbit or anything like that because it really helps break down the toughness of the meat into something much more uh, much easier to chew. A little bit more flavorful. I love being able to, you know, put the salt and the seasonings and stuff in it. 